So it's uh, my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Melanie Herman. Uh, Melanie is a psychologist, environmentalist, human computer interaction researcher with a PhD in sustainable HCI from UCL. And she now works at a digital design company, Visuality, who are trusted by the world's most important organizations to create unique tools and applications for a lasting benefit to society and the environment. Here with a talk on psychology and data visualization, welcome Melanie. Thank you. Let me just try to share my slides. Um, does success that work? coming through great. That's looking great. Over to you. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to try not to repeat all of that again. Um, I'm currently a postdoc researcher at the University of Cambridge. And nonetheless, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Visuality first. They are the company that I work with. And as you just introduced them, they are a data design company that build bespoke data viz tools that hope to inspire learning, catalyze decision making, and drive positive change. So for you to get a better idea of who they are, I've brought you a few examples of the tools that they've built. This one is the first one that's called Climate Watch. And what you can see here is global emissions over time for different countries. And this is an open data platform that helps policymakers, researchers, or any other stakeholders to gather insights on the country's progress in the fight against climate change. Global Fishing Watch is a platform that shows you near real time information of global commercial fishing activity. So this is really the basis for governments and NGOs to combat illegal fishing. The white dots that you can see on the map are individual fishing vessels and their movements. And then you can select separate data layers that show you, for example, exclusive economic zones or protected areas where fishing vessels are not allowed to enter. Global Forest Watch shows where forests are lost and gained around the world and it's used to manage forests and to stop illegal deforestation. So in the legend, you can see that you can see forest loss um, clustered by the different drivers that are responsible for the forest being lost. And related to deforestation, there's another cool tool that's called Trace. You might be aware that some trading companies are committing to reducing the deforestation associated with products they're trading. Um, the example you can see here is soy that comes from Brazil. Other famous examples, of course, would be palm oil, and Trace's ambition is to make supply chains visible and to provide information on the risk that's associated with certain agricultural commodities. So what you can see here is the soy that comes from Brazil. You can see the companies that buy um, the soy, that sell it to other companies. And well, what you can't see is the countries um, it goes to because I had to cut that off. But you can see the legend at the bottom. And just the last one. Um, this is Half Earth, and this is a project that aims to protect half of the land and sea on our planet so that we can preserve habitats and reverse species loss. And in the example here, you can see the distribution of turtles around the world. So that aims to show you areas that most need protection. I'm going to drink a sip of water and then move on to use the psychology part. So why psychology? Why would a tech company want a psychologist? on the team. Well, let me show you an example that is actually my favorite example from my economics class in my undergrad. The automotive industry actually employs quite a lot of psychologists in research and development. What you see here seems like a rather innocuous design choice. You have a car cockpit and you have to choose the illumination for the cockpit when you drive at night. And you can either pick to make it red or you can pick to make it blue. Now, this is actually a question for human factors and for neuroscience because the blue light has a higher risk for safety and security because this is a blinding light. So you might remember from biology classes in school that you have different types of receptors in the retina in the back of your eye. You have cones and you have rods. And the cones are the color ones. They allow us to see the red is red and the blue is blue. And the rods don't have so much to do with color, but they allow us to adapt to different conditions of light. So if there's very little light, say in the middle of the night, you get up, you want to grab a glass of water like I just did, or you drive in the dark, then the rods have the ability to adapt to the darkness. The sensitivity will go up and you can still see. Now, the problem is that the cones and the rods have different sensitivity ranges. That means they respond specifically to light of a certain wavelength only. 
and our light with a wavelength of 700 nanometers is what we perceive as red. And this is afforded by the red cones only. They're the only cells in your eye that will respond to the 700 nanometers. Now, if you see that type of blue in the other display, that is seen as blue by the blue cones, but it also lies within the sensitivity range of the rods. So the problem is that they will also respond to that blue light. They will lose their dark adaptation. And that is absolutely not what you want, because if you look out into the street, you want to be aware of everything that's going on. But if you look back into your car, you see that blue display, you will lose your sensitivity and you won't be able to see as well if you look back out onto the street. So I think this is a really powerful example of how design decisions affect people's ability to interact with the system. And I think this is one of the examples in my early studies that made me go into human computer interaction. So psychology in general is the study of mind and behavior, and that includes conscious and unconscious processes, thoughts and feelings. And I hope the previous example explained how neuroscience, human factors, human computer interaction are really relevant for design choices. So the visual system is really complex and it's a really intriguing one. So I'd like to give you a few more fun facts and a few quirks about the visual system and our eye. So first of all, if you remember biology classes again, or maybe physics, you might know that the eye is a lens. So the image that's produced is actually upside down. The only reason why we see the sky is up in the sky and our feet down on the ground is because the brain does some amazing job and at computationally flipping the image around once more so everything is in the right place for us. Another fun fact, if you ever observe someone when they are reading, you will notice that our eye is not able to move very smoothly from letter to letter, but rather it jumps. And these jumps, again, is something where the brain is doing an amazing job at filling in the gaps because during the jumps, we actually don't produce an image. We're not processing information, so we're technically blind. It's just we don't notice that because our brain is really good at filling the gaps in. And of course, it would be quite scary if suddenly there were these brief moments where we were blind. A practical implication of that is that loads of magazines or journals where you publish your papers choose a format where you have two narrow columns because that is actually easier for our eye. If we jump from the end of one line down to the beginning of the next line, we're less error prone if the distance is short rather than if we read text that spans the full width of the page. So just to um, basically try to, to bring across the fact that the eye and the visual system is pretty amazing. And the complexity is simply a result of evolution. And of course, we have evolved to see the natural world, to navigate our everyday life, to walk around and to process what we see and to be able to act and behave the way we do. Um, so this is an image that is very pleasant to look at and we're really good at processing it. It's quite automatic. We see it and we can instantly recognize it. Other than landscapes, there's another thing we're insanely good at, and that is faces. So in this example, we see a face under rather unnatural conditions. The face is half covered by hands, it's covered in paint, and nonetheless, we can see in a split second that it is a face. This is simply because that is something that has been quite important over the course of evolution. We are social animals, we like to see other people smile, it makes us happy to see another person smile. On the other end of the spectrum, if somebody is angry, that might be an important cue for us to either fight or flight, or in a slightly less dangerous scenario, it might just determine that we offer our partner or our colleague a cup of coffee before we try to talk to them. So there is a dedicated area in the brain that is simply responsible for processing faces. And I think that's rather impressive because if we look at modern technology, this is something we still struggle with if we use a computer. The last time I tried to use facial recognition software, the results were rather poor. It was really difficult to see in a computer setting whether a face was happy or sad or angry. And these primary emotions are something that our brain can just pick up on within the split second, and we don't even have to actively think about it. Now, natural images are easy. We're really good at that. What we're not so good at is artificial um, stuff that, you know, part of these illusions is, I, I'm sure this is something you've seen before, if you look at the bottom one, the gray lines in this image are all parallel, and yet our brain kind of tells us they're slightly bent. In the upper right corner, the vertical lines are the same length, but because of the structures around them, we tend to think that one of them is longer than the other. And the same goes for the circles and these sort of flowers on the other side. We seem to believe that the inner one in the right one is the, the inner circle in the right flower is smaller, whereas the inner circles in both of these sort of flowers are exactly the same size. So for the next slide, I don't need you to look at any of the details. 
Um, this is just to say that graph theory has been there for decades and essentially we know. We know about these elementary perceptual tasks and we know very well which ones the eye is good at and which ones we're not so good at. So if you have lines that start in the same origin, say in bar charts, it's quite easy for us to compare the length and to figure out which one the longest is. If we look at areas or angles, on the other hand, our visual system isn't quite as good with that. So this is the reason why some people are very critical of pie charts. Now, this is just about what our visual system can or can't process very easily. Now, if we take that to the next level of the experience of looking at something, there's something in psychology that we refer to as a visual discomfort or even visual stress. So this is the next level of artificial images that our visual system is just not meant for. So if we look at this, personally, I get quite dizzy if I look at that for too long. And in very vulnerable populations, this can be as bad as triggering headaches or even seizures. So visual stress is a measurable brain response. If I was to use an EEG on your head right now, I could tell from the reaction in your visual cortex that this is quite intense and that the brain is reacting quite heavily to that, which is basically just due to the unnatural distribution of spatial frequency in this image. Again, a practical application of this is line spacing. We tend to like wider line spacing because lines that are very, very narrow are a highly repetitive, highly packed visual pattern that is unpleasant for us to look at just because it is so far away from anything natural we would look at. It's the same reason that tables and papers that we publish or in journals, we're often advised to not use all the horizontal lines just because they add unnecessary visual stress to the image. And for fonts, it's the same. You can um, yeah, you know, letters have a lot of repetitive vertical lines. And again, depending on the font, we find them more or less pleasing, more or less stressful. The great thing is that computational models can analyze pictures and they can determine how much stress is associated with an image. So we could feed this image into a piece of software and it will give us a warning to avoid this design. So I've been reviewing a lot of platforms on environmental data this. And I think this might be one of my favorites just because it's so much fun. Fix My Street is a platform where you can report and discuss local problems. Um, this is an area of London that I know very well. Um, and the note that you can see a little bit bigger because it's collected in the middle was a story that um, somebody had submitted there complaining about a lady who was feeding, feeding pigeons in the street and it was so many pigeons that the person complained they were fouling the streets and they were holding up traffic. So I find that website very entertaining if you read the user stories. The bit that I don't like so much is the special frequency. So if you look at all those narrow black lines that show the houses and the streets, I think this is something that is not very pleasant for the human eye to look at. And looking at this image, I would like to transition to my next point. So if you hold out your finger in front of your face and you focus on your finger, you will notice that everything else is slightly blurry. If you don't want to feel stupid holding up your finger, just focus on Finsbury Park in the middle of this image. So if you focus on Finsbury Park, the word, you notice that you can't read any of the other words written on this map. And that is because we actually have a very, very small bit in our visual field that we can see in high resolution. It's two degrees of our visual angle. So we're all on different computer screens. They all have a different size, but I'm guessing we're all roughly 50 to 60 centimeters away from the screen. So on that sort of screen, the area that you can see in high resolution at any given time is roughly two square centimeters. So we have big screens, we have a lot of data, and yet we can't change this physiological restriction. We can only ever look at a really small size of an image. So in addition to that physiological restriction, there are other restrictions, visual attention and memory. They both have very limited capacity. So let's go back to the coffee and the colleague. You can easily drink your coffee and smell it and taste it and talk to your colleague. But if you have two colleagues who try to talk to you at the same time, you won't be able to listen to both of them just because you don't have the auditory, in this case, attention to pay attention to two things that are going on at the same time. So an example to show you how limited visual attention is I brought you this one. It's called feature search and conjunction search. So if your task is to find the green tea, that is pretty easy in the feature search because it's just one there. And even if I add loads of other distractors that have a different characteristic, in this case, the color red, it doesn't really matter. It's, it is really easy. You can do that instantaneously. But 
if you need to analyze two different features, color and shape in the conjunction search, it takes us much longer. So it's a relatively easy task, but still, just by adding the structures that have a similar, or in this case, the same color, we need to invest a lot more cognitive effort to find a target in the display. This one shows how limited our short-term memory is. It's a very simple grid of 12 letters, and yet I think it's quite unlikely that you're able to memorize all 12 of them and recall them correctly if I take the slide away in a moment. So to summarize, we have the physiological restriction of not being able to see a lot at any given time. We have a very limited capacity of our visual attention and of our memory. So that means that very cluttered displays are quite difficult for us to look at and to process. This is one that I personally do find quite cluttered. Um, again, going back to the jumps that our eyes make and the color choice in this one, um, I find it quite problematic. If I look at the legend on the right, the community indicators, the median price of homes sold, I find that my eyes need to dart back and forth quite a lot between the map and the legend because the colors are quite similar and I can't really analyze or even remember um, which color is which price category and why I find that on the map. One last concept I'd like to talk about is mental models. Mental models are essentially the representation of reality in your mind. That sounds fancier than it is. It just means that you can imagine a dog in your mind right now. You know what it looks like, or a cat, or a horse. And then we also have external models. So think of an architectural model that is a miniature version of a building, or a piece of database. That is an external model. Now, the thing is that the more abstract the model is, be the architectural one or the piece of database, the more effort we have to invest to recognize and understand it. I'm going to show you an example from my PhD research, um, which was all around smart meters. So some of you might have one at home. This is one of the in-home displays that you get, and they typically have a rather simple data visualization. It shows you in green, amber, and red how much energy you're using. Now, if you have um, an online account where you can sign in, you will see more detailed information. Um, if you look at research papers, you will find that overall, the most common visualizations for energy data are time series line graphs. And that seems to make a lot of sense, right? Because that is what the data is. You have a timestamp and you have a power reading. So it only seems obvious that you would put the time on the X axis and power on the Y axis. And this is actually a sketch that a householder made. So even for householders, it is intuitive to do it this way. But in the very same study and in other studies I did, I found that when people receive data feedback in this line graph format, they can't actually learn very much from it. They are very likely to go away saying, okay, I know that my peak consumption time is 8 p.m., but then again, that is something they knew before. So this is very data-driven. As I said before, this is showing what the data is. It's power over time. But that's not really how I think about energy as a householder, right? What I want to learn is how do I use my energy? What do I use it for? What is the biggest... Um, cost factor in the household, which appliances are consuming most energy. So this is where social sciences come in, right? Where we think about the mental models that people have. And people think about washing their laundry or making a cup of tea. They don't really think about energy as electricity that are used to power a heating element. And I'm not really interested as a householder in the particular pattern that an appliance creates over time. So in another study, we used this pictographic representation that was informed by social practice theory and the mental model that people have. And in this display, the information is provided in an appliance or activity-centric way. And the responses people had to that were much better. They said, well, with this, it's really obvious. I see the appliance and I immediately understand that this is how much I used my dishwasher or this is the energy I used for washing my laundry and so on. So the point in this is that if the visual representation is very abstract or is very different from my own personal mental model, then it is harder for me to actually extract information from the data and to learn from it. So I talked about how visual discomfort, attention, memory, and mental models all affect my understanding of a piece of data viz. Now, what are the specific research questions I'm interested in? Obviously, we want to find out which features make a visualization successful. So say you have data set X concerning topic Y. What do I do? Do I go for a map? Do I go for a dashboard? What piece of data viz do I pick to make the most of it? And hopefully 
where it can develop a set of guidelines or recommendations, so to say, a science of data viz, to make sure that whatever we do with big data leads to a piece of data data viz that is impactful and easy to understand for people. This is just something I talked about, and we're very interested to understand how that affects the interaction. So it might be that if an interface is very stressful or has too much clutter, too much data frequency, it subconsciously affects how long people choose to spend on that platform. If it causes a headache, then obviously I will choose to not look at it as long as a more pleasing website. Map projections and the use of 3D are a very interesting question. So if you have a globe at home and you look at that and then you compare it to a map, you will notice that maps always distort the size of countries. So some countries will appear bigger than they are on a map and others will appear smaller than they are, which of course has immediate implications for the, the cognitive um, decision making because I'm very prone to over or underestimate the size of certain countries. So the globe is actually, well, obviously a much better representation of our planet because our planet is a globe and therefore the globe is the best model we can provide of it. Um, 3D is another aspect that might increase how realistic a piece of data this is. So more and more websites using geodata, showing maps, showing globes, use 3D to show details and maps that we haven't really seen in the past and there's a lot of development going on at the moment. And the last one I find very intriguing is how to visualize change over time on a map. So if we're interested in deforestation, for example, this is something we see as a piece of geodata, but we want to show it on a map and we want to show the change over time. So I brought you an example of not deforestation, but an example of showing change over time. So the bottom slider is the one where you can move through time. And in this one, you actually have a second one where you can vary different scenarios. So you can manipulate if you want to see a low emission scenario or a high emission scenario. If we go back to what we said about memory, then I think from a cognitive perspective, this is not a great design. It looks nice and it seems to invite interaction, but I don't think that it is possible to look at this heat map and to memorize the color of all the pixels, move the sliders, and still remember what it looked like before and see all the different changes. So I think this is a very tricky one in terms of showing change over time because it's just defying the, the laws of how much we can process and me memorize. Global Forest Watch is a really interesting one from the perspective of mental models. It shows you loss and gain in two different colors at the same time. So the blue color is tree cover gain and the pink color is tree cover loss. My mental model is trees being there, trees being lost, or new trees being planted. So from a mental model perspective, I would say the most intuitive thing would be to show green pixels and to increase them if more forest is planted or decrease them if forest is chopped down. However, I do have to say that from a signal detection perspective, the pink stands out really well. It's a very salient color and it immediately attracts our attention. So if we want to draw the user's attention towards the forest loss, then the pink is probably a very powerful solution in guiding attention and drawing people in. And the last example I brought is this one on accidents in the UK. The peak is of course London. Um, and I think this is a very nice one. This is a really nice fit for our mental model because we associate high rates with high bars. And on top of that, we have a double coding with color. Red is a color that we perceive as dangerous. So that makes sense. And thanks to the double coding of using the height of the bars and the colors, this is also accessible. So somebody who might have impaired color vision can still use the height of the bars. And on top of it, I just think it looks really cool. So I think that 3D is just a great opportunity to make more beautiful data visualizations because after all we do want to engage people we want them to have an immersive experience and to want to spend time on the website and to learn from it so to come to an end i would like to share this quote as a closing thought it says that the conclusions people can draw from their analytical efforts are restricted by the form in which they receive data and their limited analytical capabilities this is from a paper on energy data so the missing dots that I cut out um, that said price and consumption data, but it really applies to any context where people need to understand data. And I've been reviewing environmental data tools and I've seen quite a lot that don't respect people's natural analytical capabilities. 
And I think this is something really important to keep in mind that the format in which we communicate and people's ability to process that format will determine how successful we will be in communicating the data that we want to show them. And hopefully that has also explained why a tech company would want a cognitive scientist on the team. Um, I think in the sustainability community, we still struggle. We, we don't have a good ability to measure the impact we have. This is not well understood yet, how we can guarantee that from, we can go from having the knowledge to disseminating it, to people understanding it and acting on it. So this is really what this project is about. We want to take the first steps to optimize platforms in line with human cognition so that we can facilitate good understanding and good decision making. And of course, the goal is that the websites have greater pleasure, that they have high memorability, and that we can reach more people and those people can extract more insights, thus multiplying the impact that we can have. These are my contacts. Um, follow me on Twitter. I blog about my work on Medium. If you were interested in this at all, if you have any questions or you want to catch up on anything, please drop me a message. I would love to talk to you. So thank you for listening.